This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world-famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog, and the Laugh Button Podcast Network. This is Dan Natterman here via Zoom with Noam Dorman, who's joining us from his home. Uh, Noam Hello. is the owner of the world-famous and ever-expanding comedy seller. We're here with Periel Ashenbrand, the producer of the show, Hi. and with our special guest, Judy Gold, who we were talking about just last week or two weeks ago. Last week, Noam, you weren't here, I believe. But two weeks ago, Noam, you were telling us that we have no choice. We must see Judy's new one-person show. And called were... Yes, I Can Say That. It's always good to do your due diligence before you. Um... Yes, I Can Say That is the name of the show. And, Judy, you're quite right. Um, and, yeah. Noam, uh, you were, you were uh, absolutely over the moon in your... In your um, Compliments in your effusion. What, what's the word I'm looking for? He was effusive. He was effusive. I was, I was gobsmacked. In a way, he seldom, I was. I was gobsmacked. In a way, he seldom is. Uh -huh. Not not never, but seldom. Well, I was gobsmacked, but you know, t time time is tempered it a little bit. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I was going to punch your face. Huh? No, it was it was I'm absolutely. I was very proud uh, just to know Judy. I was so proud to 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 know. Oh. I mean, it was so good. It was so good. Thank you, Noam. And guess what? What? Noam came to the party afterwards. That's how much he liked it. Yeah. This yeah. was a premiere party? Yes. Yes. And did Noam come stag or did he bring did he bring no, his he lovely brought wife? this lovely woman named Juanita? Okay, that would who be his, is just gorgeous. His wife, as yes. the listeners may or may not know. Um so this show is based on your book of the same name? The book is called Yes, I Can Say That. When they come for the comedians, we're all in trouble. This is based on the on the book, but it is much more personal. And B.D. Wong directed it, and that is why I think it's such an emotional journey and very personal and, um, and a play. It's a play. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Do you do different characters? You're always Judy. In, in, well, I in do the, the essence when I'm... When I am uh, quoting a comedian uh, or doing a bit from their act to prove a point uh, or make a statement, I try to get the essence of them, but I'm not like... You're not imitating. No. Noam, can you tell us a little bit about your reaction to the show? And then maybe Judy can tell us a little bit about what it was about. Why don't you just, Judy, just tell you what it's about? My, I told you my reaction. I told you, I thought she was fantastic. Well, tell, why don't you tell Judy? I did tell her. He All just right. did. Okay. God, it, it, it's listen, like. But, but, but part of the show incorporates, the book The book was about um, comedians um, and, and the current climate in which comedians well, it's, are it's, censored. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of history in the book and there's a lot of history in the show. Um, but you know, it's, I thought it would be easy to adapt it from a book, but it was actually harder than writing a one person show from scratch. Uh, because how do you pick and what is going to make this show, you know, move along and be a journey where people are, you know, focusing the whole time. So, uh, there's a lot of history in this too, but the book is really each, each chapter is a polemic about, a, a certain part of what it's like to be a comedian and, and related to free speech. Um, but there's history in this too. And I also think it's a call to action. Like we're in fucking trouble here. You know, come on people. This isn't like funny, silly stuff anymore. This banning of books and all this shit. It's ridiculous. So you, you integrate your life story with the notion of, my comedy life story. Your comedy life how story. How I started and who my influences were. And and the censorship that you have faced and still face? Well, I use other people, I guess, as examples, but um, I talk a lot about the Holocaust. I talk about what it was like being a, a, a woman in the 80s doing stand-up and then coming out, uh, what, how that affected my career. Um, and... Yeah, it's 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 I think it's such a rich people. The thing that was so interesting about it is we got we have gotten all great reviews. I don't read them, but Elisa, my lover, said that 
each reviewer, something else stuck with them. So it wasn't like it's the same thing. I think it different parts of the show resonate with different people. Well, then, Noam, as a reviewer, which resonated most with you? Um... We're gonna cut. This. I I don't know what resonated mostly. Uh, I, I wasn't reviewing it. What what resonated with me was how talented Judy was, uh, mm-hmm. and how how entertaining the whole thing uh, was, and how it how it kept my interest. I I mean, I don't think the point of my review would be about the deep message of the show, although the message is the message of the show is deep and important. Um, but this is a message that, you know, especially in our industry, we all agree with, and we all right. have um, aired out at various times. It was the, um, the execution which had me floored because I'm usually anxious to leave any show that I attend, even if it's a good <laughs> one. As I've said, I've never been to a Broadway show where at intermission... I was happy there was another half coming. You know, I always, no matter how good it was, I always would have been fine if that's where it ended. And when, when I heard the Judy show was how long does it run Judy? 80. Yeah. I heard 80 minutes. minutes. I was like, Oh God, an hour and 20 minutes. You know, I was really not, not anxious. And it went out. It really, you know, cliche. It went by in the blink of an eye. I I couldn't believe it was over. Um, Just it, it, it moved along. It was expertly, expertly presented. Um, That's really what, but had me a star is born. That's what that would have been my headline. Uh, but you know, was born sixty years ago. Um, <laughs> and happy belated. Yeah, thank you. But <laughs> the B D Wong is he's just brilliant. I mean, he was. I was writing with my friend Eddie Sarfati and getting the script in shape, and he is also helping us along with the script, but. He's working with these designers to make it a theatrical experience. I didn't even know what he had in mind with these designers, it, and it just came to life. It's it's unbelievable. Eighty minutes of just you—that sounds like a that's that sounds like a workout to me. That, oh, I'm exhausted. That that would be you know. I mean, after forty five minutes uh, of stand up, it's 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 not stand up though. But I'm saying a, I've, when it's just you and yes, you're the yes, only yes. one who's doing all the talking, that's kind of a long time, right? But uh, it's I love telling the story. I don't get I don't go. Oh God, here we go. I can't wait to get to the next section and the next section because it's just it builds and builds and builds and it it does keep people people's interest. People are really affected by it, and we've done a bunch of talkbacks after, and people just can't wait to ask questions. And, do you yeah. do you think the situation we're talking about? What you, yes yes I can't say that which is the book mm-hmm. and the title of the show. Um, do you think that that we're worse off now, or things are just different? Like you, 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 you can be out as a uh, lesbian on stage, and and as you could not be in the eighties, is that mm-hmm. correct? Right. So that's an improvement. In terms and of- I couldn't be in mainstream comedy. Right. That would have just been, but it did definitely had an effect on my career. I came out in the mid nineties, but and it had a profound effect on my career. You know, I've also been told not to be too Jewish, and um, you know, it, it it it's it's a different time now. But now the left, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? Like, uh, uh, like, shut the fuck up! I, I I don't understand. It's so look. The right has never been hilarious. Let, <laughs> let's admit it. There are how many really right wing conservative funny people are there? Well. There might be closet right wing people that are funny, and you you know I think there's a lot of comedians that have slightly right of center views that you might not be slightly aware of. right and right wing are completely different, I think, but liberal conservative is smaller, liberal is bigger you know you're you're attuned to other people and they're and and they are characters in your stories and you're you know you I, I don't know. I just I, I, the left really pisses me off with the crybaby. You said this word. I'm not listening to the whole fucking joke because I heard a word, <laughs> and it's all about me, 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 me. It's just it's horrible. And then you have the right wing banning books and telling teachers what they can talk about and what. And it's no. This is a terrible situation we have here. 
Do you think personally that are there things that offend that would offend you? Not that they shouldn't be said, but that you have, if you saw a comedian saying certain things, you would kind of be disgusted and and uh, yeah, I've been disgusted numerous times. It, they have a right to say whatever the fuck they want. Right. I have a right to say I don't like it and then move on with my life. What is this shit where you don't like something and then that person's career has to be destroyed? Like, what is that? You know, and there's a line in the show about, you know, going to a comedy club. My friend Eddie says this all the time. Um, going to a comedy club and expecting not to get offended is like getting on a roller coaster and expecting not to get scared. It's part of this whole process. And the audience, is re their response is the vital element of our creative process. And you're going to turn on us? We're trying to find out where the line is. Like, that's why I only want to work at the Comedy Cellar. No one has a fucking phone. No one's recording. No one's like, you know, the first time when they implemented the, the no. no phone thing, um, the first set I did after that, I was at the Fat Black doing an hour. And... um. I was on stage, I was like, oh, wow, this audience is so great. And I looked down at the tables, and there were these pouches with everyone's phone in it. I almost started crying because it was like what comedy was before, where people went and they were listening, and it was you were the whole audience was together. They were a unit, you know? It's it, this no. social media, yeah, the dumbing down, it's it's all a part of it. No, no what well, was Judy, the impetus what, to yeah. Can I, can I say a cut because she's she's bringing something I'm curious about. Do you now that we've been having those bagging those shows for a while, bagging those uh, can, yeah, phones, the phones are while, in the bags. Yeah. Um, and you play at other clubs. Do you think it's different? The shows are different to the seller because of the phones are bagged. One hundred fifty thousand percent. Hundred fifty. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it is. It is. You know, the thing about the seller, and I, there are other clubs that do this, a handful, you know, their first priority is the comedian. That doesn't happen in most clubs. It's all about the money, the audience, the audience. They're, they, I have never felt unsafe. I mean, I hate the word safe or anything uh, like that. I, I don't even want to use the word safe. I have never felt uh, threatened. <laughs> underappreciate I don't know you know, it, it there's something about having some respect I have never felt disrespected by anyone at the comedy cellar except for Valerie who just <laughs> I walked in and she said she said that that table is just for comedians and I said Valerie I have been doing stand-up for 40 years uh, and she's like oh I just started here I said okay <laughs> is that true <laughs> yes well what's so, so funny nice. about that What's so funny about that? It was one of the lessons I, I I'm keeping a list of things that lessons I want to teach my kids because I'm afraid I might not be around to teach them. So I'm going to try to leave them like a. Oh God! You know, that was yeah. a, I think that was a movie with Michael Keaton. But yeah. No, I'm afraid I'm going to try to teach them like Fortress of Solitude, like you know Superman's dad, like you know, like try to leave them videos. But little slights can stay with people the rest of their fucking lives. Oh my like, God. <laughs> It's amazing. You've but you never you're not forgot still that. Angry at Valerie about that, are you? No, but I'm going to tease her for oh. the you know the, every time I see her. It's true. You know, you yeah. think about when comedians first start out, start out, start out, and the shit that you know I hear young comedians. Well, first of all, one of the other things in the show that that I was did a lot of research for the show, and I talked to comedians who've been doing it a year, and they tell me they have to play it safe. To get on stage there's certain topics they're not supposed to talk about like at these brooklyn stages or these very like woke right um and that's that is just the antithesis of stand-up but uh it's true that you know every young comedian comedian remembers one nasty every nasty piece of shit horrible thing someone has said to them about their act or just, yeah. just to take a maybe a counter argument here um, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that things are worse today <clears throat> in terms of censorship. Of course, we have social media and, and that and that is it can be very nasty. But remember, Dice Clay, this was going back 30 years, did his show. Now, he did it to a sold out audience, but he received a lot of backlash 
for some of the things that he said about women. He did jokes about uh, that were seen as degrading to women. And um, they, I be, and and um, there was a lot of backlash. I think they tried to get. He hosted Saturday Night Live, and there was some protesting that went on uh, for that. So uh, you know, um, I think there's always been people that that react this way to comedians. They didn't have social media behind them to organize, and so that's a definite difference. Okay, Dan. First of all, I write about Andrew Dice Clay in the book. Andrew Dice Clay is a character. Who's a misogynist. Right. But people and, didn't interpret it. Some people interpreted it right, otherwise. And that people are going to interpret things the way they interpret things. Um, a, there was no social media. That is absolutely correct. People didn't like him. That's fine. You're allowed to protest. You're allowed. Right. But to get on social media, the fact that Kathy Griffin was holding a, a, a mask with ketchup on it, uh, and she can't answer her phone. She is loses everything. She's got the FBI after her. I mean, come on. And this motherfucker is inciting, inciting violence and, and, and an insurrection. And he's can re- well, he's remained in power for four fucking years. It's not right. Comedians are trying to make you laugh. And it's sometimes it doesn't, it's not, doesn't hit right. But that doesn't mean they should be silenced. I I believe in free speech for even the comedians I think are offensive and horrible. You, you should all be able to say what you want. But you also have a choice to turn it off. And it's not about you. It's not about you. No one's thinking about you. And you can joke about anything as long as it's funny. I happen to find Andrew Dice Clay, those stupid poems, they're silly and stupid and hilarious. They're so stupid. But the, but the point I was making is that some people didn't realize it was a character or didn't right, and felt idiots. that he was a misogynist. But, but, but the, did he the, still work? But did the, he still work and make a lot of money? He still worked. Right. That, but now people are being canceled. Canceled. Well, pe- losing pe- work. People are losing work, but people, but there are many, but the good news is, is that because of social media, there's also more opportunities to make an end run. Like, for example, Shane Gillis, I talk denied, about him and was show. denied his uh, his right, spot at Saturday Night Live, but is able now to do podcasts and he's and, a, he's and, a funny, funny guy and he's a nice guy. But you know, he's working for a, a corporation now. He, maybe Lorne Michaels was like, "I still want him," but it doesn't mean the NBC execs, uh, you know, if he's gonna if he's gonna scare away advertisers, that's their number one priority. So. You know, it was a corporate decision. He still can say whatever the hell he wants. But, Dan, and I I will say this, and I get this a lot from from white men. I do. Uh, And I have to say that if you have never had to, if you've never marched in a, in a, a protest because they're taking away your rights, or no one's ever had to stand in front of the Supreme Court for your own, for your hum, human rights you're you're an entitled person and you know i see things differently than you see things because i'm a lesbian i'm a woman i'm a jew you're a jew i'm a jew but you know it it is a different experience for who, us who 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 do you blame mostly for the Shane Gillis affair the corporate suits at nbc or the online mob or do they share equal blame well, I, I probably a combination of both. I mean, who who knows? How did the how did the NBC the corporate people not anticipate that was going to happen? You know, it wasn't like it was, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. It was within the a couple of years, right? So uh, I, I don't I, I do think it's a corporate thing and I, yes i think it was influenced by the online mob i i, I want to say some couple That's things we're yeah. way off the subject but two things um one thing is that you know humor is is very 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 difficult to explain or to quantify or to explain uh, to to understand and um you know let's say andrew dice clay is a misogynist i don't know that he's not a misogynist and let's say let's say he's telling those jokes and he and he really he really you know means them in some way. 
Does that mean I'm not allowed to laugh at them? Like when, when Larry David t- says about Jewish people, he goes, you know, we are a bit much. <laughs> you know, I love that line. And uh, now I what is I mean, there is he's he's tipping his hat to something which he thinks is a little bit true there. It's funny. I, I can't right. really explain. I, I, yeah. So so I, I mean, there are there, there are differences between men and women. And I kind of. I, I kind of bristle at the whole notion that we we're, we're granting the idea that somebody who jokes about them or believes them uh, is a misogynist. I think a misogynist in in real life is something much worse uh, than, than a dude who says, oh, these women, Jesus, you know, like because we all have these feelings. And, and by the way, women are totally open and, and free to tell men this and men that. And people of color Absolutely. are totally open to say white men right. this and white men that. So, so it's not as if we, they don't every day accept the theoretical basis that populations are different. But if a white man wants to make an observation along those lines, he's a misogynist. Or we have to say, well, he doesn't really believe that stuff. People of color, they believe that stuff about white people. Women believe that stuff about men. And they're allowed to and they're right. And you go, girl. You're speaking truth to power. But if a man says something, you know, that he observes about the difference between the opposite sex, and he, he's a misogynist. So I, I, I want to say okay, that. Okay, so when do you yeah. think that started, that 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 white male is a misogynist? Like, Wait, can, when I, do I don't know. But let's, I want to make one, other, one, I, I wanna make one other observation. I want to make one other observation um, to what you said. So... You know, I, I read you loud and clear when you say that if you've never had to march before the Supreme Court for your basic rights, that uh, you have you're an experience. That you're, yeah, you, well, ha- you were entitled, that you haven't yeah, had to yeah. do that. It's yes, true. But, but, I wanna, but I want to tell you, yes, and, and, but I want to also say that I was reading through old letters of my father today. He saved a lot of letters, and some of them were letters that he wrote, but he didn't send, which was pretty interesting. And it was a vivid snapshot. This was from the sixties of a man who was fucking struggling. He was yeah. broke, broke. He had an ulcer because his partner was, uh, was, had, was, was suing him without integrity. My mother was trying to take custody from me, from him. I was, he was raising a single child. He was trying to build a new business. I mean, the fucking guy was, was, I can't even imagine the water that he was under uh, psychologically. And he came out of it. And now if he were alive today, people would say to him, well, Manny, you know, you were privileged. You're, 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 you're a white man. This is, this is your entitlement, you know? So I don't know while, if that's wh- true. No, well, we, we do. I didn't say you would say that, but people say it all the time. Right. In other words, all, all the, right. what I'm saying is that people have terrible struggles. The struggle that you're describing is a shame on the United States of America. Right. And, and as a society, we have to address that because we're a democracy. We have to address that. But what does right. get lost in all this talk of entitlement and privilege and, what, and all that is that there are many, many ways that people struggle terribly in life. Absolutely. And these, I, and, yeah, and these, these quasi-legal discrimination ways, are, these are awful. And they were more awful, God knows, and, and maybe they continue to be awful for you know a, a trans person in a certain red state or whatever it is. I'm, I'm not yeah. trying to minimize the suffering of any human in any sense. But I do think there is something about this movement which does try to minimize the suffering of others in the process of calling righteously our attention to their struggle. So, you know, just I, I really, I, I'll show you some I of those totally letters. It was, it was really stunning. Point, yeah, but I'm, yeah. I'm talking about in relationship to comedy. Yes, so, yeah. you know, I, I don't have the privilege of being like an observational comic because that's not what I think about. I think right. about my struggles and, and what it's like and the unfairness. So that's what I talk about in my act. You know, a man and and same with a woman who's just like, you know, I find that to be lazy comedy. You know, when you're just, you know, just gratuitously trying to get a reaction out of people when you're not really crafting material. Um, 
And so... Well, you're not saying observational comedy is lazy. No! I think observational comedy is great. I think that people who do that um, and are great at it, it's a, it, it is a skill. But I can't do that because I'm angry. And, and I'm trying to navigate through this world as a 60-year-old woman who's a lesbian and a you look great. dyke, thank you, and a Jew, and I've had to fight for every fucking thing. Do I, have I ever been like, oh, it's so hard. Never. I've always just done my work. I've done my work. No. I've done my work. And I've, and I, and, and I have heard so many misogynist things. And I was just like, you know what? That's what they do. I want to be a great comic. And I think that, especially like when we were doing Tough Crowd, I, I was like a, a comic. That was it. I wanted to just. I never was like fucking the guys because a hey, I'm a lesbo, but I just always wanted to just do comedy and be great at stand up. And I think that everyone respected me for that. And I wasn't like fucking around and I wasn't like, hey, 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 hey. Um, and I think both men and women do that. Um, but, and it, it, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, you're a great comedian. You can see the world through their eyes. We, we, and, we, and okay. yeah. And your father was also an immigrant. Um, I mean, look at, uh, um, Robin Williams struggling with depression and, you know, there's reasons why these people are funny. Um, right. and I don't, I think that that isn't pushed by the wayside, but what I'm saying is because I am othered or I'm fighting for all this shit, I think about that when I'm, when I'm getting on stage and I have a microphone. We, we talk a lot about, and it's a lot is said about being a women in comedy uh, trans people in comedy and 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 gay people in comedy. You mentioned being Jewish, and you say that that's actually affected you as well. Um, you you feel you've had to rein in your Jewishness, or been no, told never. to rein in your. Jewishness? I was told to rein in my Jewishness. I was always told, and when I did the Tonight Show for the first time, I think it was ninety five. Uh, I did some jokes about my mother and a woman from the Jewish Daily Forward. Like complained, oh, you're doing a, you're promoting stereotypes. I'm like, shut the fuck. That is how my mother talks. That's exactly what she said. It's funny, and you're sitting in your apartment on the Upper West Side, um, and I'm traveling around the United States talking about my Jewish mother. Shut the fuck up. That's about you. Most of this shit is about the person who is complaining. And you, you did all around the country. You would reference being Jewish, even if Absolutely. you were in the middle, middle west. Yes, yes. I've been. Oh, please! People yelling shit. The Jews have all the money. Um, That's the title of this episode. The Jews have all the money. <laughs> oh my God! I was in Georgia. They're like, yeah, Jew uh, you know what's so funny? This was so interesting. I remember. I guess it was the early nineties. There was a comic, Linda Smith, who went on the road, and she was Italian and Irish. And she called me from a gig, I don't know where, in the South or something. And she said to me, um, they thought I was Jewish, and they were so awful to me. And... That was like that was the first time I ever heard anyone. I mean, it was it was mass. Oh, you're so New York, and you know, whatever they were. And she, she was like, oh my god, they they think I'm Jewish. She got on stage. They were so horrible, and she realized. Oh, and she said in the middle of the set, oh, you think I'm not Jewish, but you think I'm Jewish. And it, and that was the first time I ever heard anyone, you know, acknowledge who wasn't Jewish. That that the only thing I can. You know, I don't talk about being Jewish, but it's obvious enough to anybody that's familiar with Jews, which I guess not everybody right. is. But I was in South Dakota doing a show a few months ago, and two people after the show said to ask me, hey, are you a Jew? <laughs> and I'm not even sure they meant anything by right. it. They might have just been curious. They've never seen one before in the flesh. But I perhaps I reminded them of Seinfeld, what, what little they know yeah, about. Yeah, you look exactly like Jerry. What, 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 but whatever little they know about Judaism and being Jewish, right. they knew enough that that they thought I was one. Right. And they said, are you a Jew? And I said, yeah. And they goes, and one guy goes, really? <laughs> like he was sort of surprised, like, wow, they exist in, in the wild, you know? Uh, but I'm not even, I'm not prepared to say that was anti-Semitic. I just think that. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, make any sense to me. The, there's, cool. Jews on, there's Jews everywhere on, on TV and politics, on right. show business. How can they not? Right. I mean, it's everywhere. 
But and who cares? Are you a Jew? And that but I, I don't know what they meant. But it's a weird phraseology. Right. Yeah, right. it is. A, a weird Jew yeah. is a but, little more aggressive but, than but, 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 I guess. But I guess they own their own. I guess they own their own home. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. But that doesn't mean that they meant it in a negative way because all because they were very complimentary about my comedy and wanted to take pictures with me. These same people. So right. I don't know how to interpret that question other than maybe just genuine curiosity about something that they had probably little contact with in person. Uh, you know, maybe they've seen it on television. But. Well, that's, you know, so from where you're sitting, you're giving them the benefit of the doubt. I give them the benefit of the doubt, but right. I don't know. I don't, I can't. I can't from where I'm sitting because I've had different experiences. And I think that that, I would, that would bring, I wouldn't that put your Well, I was up? uncomfortable for sure. But I have to say these people that just, you know, maybe a Jew is, not everybody okay. knows well, that that's an impolite Way to but, say and it. You, didn't you, say have to give them, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt because What's, you 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 are you're a human you're in a human situation. You would probably right. very likely interpret some nastiness or antagonism or you know a bad vibe in the question right. if that's what it was. People are not so likely to just come up. I mean, it would it would be I think it would be completely apparent to you if, if they were had a negative vibe about that, wouldn't they, Dan? But wouldn't I would have, I would have, I mean, just well, how me, would you have responded to that? I question? would have said, well, first of all, they wouldn't have had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, uh, I would have asked them why they asked. I, why do you ask? I, I, I really would be curious. Well, I don't want to, I didn't want to hear the answer. <laughs> right, exactly. I want to hear the answer. I didn't want I wanna to hear why they need to know that. No, I, I wouldn't have wanted to hear the answer why they made that assumption. Don't you have a joke ready why? for that? Like, yeah, well, how much do you said, need? Well, you know, Jews have big noses and you got a real big nose. So I thought maybe that was it. Well, th that's. Like, I didn't need to hear that. So I just uh, just said, yes, I am. And and uh, and, and went about my day or evening. Okay. Well, uh, that's you. And that's the difference between us, Dan. Okay. Because I would have been like, why are you asking? Do you have any more questions for me? <laughs> um, I'm Yes, I'm very rich. <laughs> Um, I'm really, I own show business and I also own a bank. You guys need to take it easy. <laughs> Who's asking? Don't you think Noam looks so good with his beard? Thank Noam, you. by the way, just getting yeah. back to, um, Sorry. the, and the, the phones in the bags. Yeah. What was your impetus? And by the way, you have been checking your phone multiple times. I, I'm sorry. It's called obsessive compulsive disorder. I have. I, I, got, I, got, I, I got so mad at Dan the other day. And I wanted to apologize to him, but then I feel like he deserved it. He, he, Dan, we were at the show. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to do this. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, by the way, no, no, you were, you were, uh, in the audience the other yeah. night whilst I was on stage. Whilst? Yes, whilst. Um, which I don't love seeing because I feel a little bit of extra pressure, but you got to see my act. Do you have any impressions? It was Jewy, very no, I... Jewy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've you seen Jewish? you. I've seen, you're, you're, fact, you're funny as ever, Dan. What's the, what's the okay. question? I thought maybe you had, you know, you I wanted did some, it to get. I wanted more, com more compliment. I thought you'd be a little more effusive about because I had a pretty good set. Although it started off, I was a little bit me, stuttery. Me, 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 me. Because me, Noam was me, in the audience. Me, 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 me. Listen, <laughs> do, have you been to cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy? Uh, I no, I never tried cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, I would recommend that. I have. OCD and ADD, D, 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 D. It's very, it's very helpful. It gives you the tools. Mm -hmm. So when you get that impulse where you're like, nope, no, I'm not going to, no, I have control over this. Yeah. Does it help premature ejaculation? <laughs> um, I still it have that. It probably oh. could if it <laughs> yeah. you directed it toward that. Yeah. No, what was your impetus initially to put the phones, to make people put the phones in the bag? I don't know if we've discussed um, this before, uh, but just I, as a I, review. Uh, because uh, Ch Chappelle was uh, asking clubs to do it with these yonder bags. And um, I felt I was incorrect. I felt that this was an inevitability. And I was trying to get out in front of it. The yonder, the yonder bags were not practical for us because of the time it takes to bag them and to close them and to open them after the show. Uh, so I began to brainstorm or, or actually Liz and Tony began to brainstorm of what, what, what our alternatives were. We talked about 
things under the table, lockers, blah, blah, blah. And then Tony came up with this idea like these Amazon bags, you know, because the room is small and those are not that easy to open. But um, that way at the end of the show, people can just leave with them and then open them on their own and throw them out. So we tried it and it was relatively easy and the comedians liked it right away. So that, that's why I did it. I, I was sure the entire industry was going to fall in behind us, but they haven't. I, I just don't understand why they don't. I, I don't you know, at my at the theater on, uh, I think it was Saturday matinee, there's a woman in the front row, like, Text. with the phone, texting, like, right up by her face, and the thumbs are moving. And it was so, I mean, I have to focus so much on this show. It's the script, you know? And I, I... At first, I made a gesture to the guy who was sitting next to her, like, mm-mm. And then I I had to stop and say, can you please put your phone away? Like, wow. it's so, there's an announcement. You can't shut off your fucking phone for 80 fucking minutes? Like, nothing, what's going to happen? But you, no, but no you need to answer your question. You some, about, Judy, you need some stock material for that kind of situation. I know. No, I'm to answer your question about why the industry, and by the industry, I'll confine it to comedy clubs. Why they haven't followed suit. I think it's just logistics. It takes manpower and time to put those phones in the bag. I don't know if Noam is listening. Noam, I mean, how much how much manpower do you devote to putting phones in the bags and it's significant, doing all of that? It's uh, you know, not every club I mean it takes it takes some doing and Yeah, well the, so the, other, I think club, the other clubs have check spots. Now why do they have check spots? Oh I know. And they, have, and they have the check spots for the, they have the check spots for the last show too. When they don't have another crowd coming in, like what? Just, why, just, what's to, just for those who may not know uh, the what a check spot is, is is well, the comic is on stage. They're giving people their checks instead of waiting till the show is completely over to hand out the check. It's the usually camera. at the end of the second to last person, right before the MC comes on and is supposed to eat it for. T- you know, so the crowd is busy calculating before. their checks. They're looking at the check. And so the, whoever's on stage at the time does not get the benefit of the audience's attention. But also what happens is during the check spot, they put the least um, – the, 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 uh, least, the newer comic? The newer comic, yes. Uh, the newer comic, that's your time. That's you're going to – you get dude. to go on no, no, when no. no one's no, paying no, no. attention. Let, let me let – me, let, that's true sometimes, but they also do it for headlining shows. Yeah, I know. And – the, imagine you're at a movie, and at the climactic time in the movie, that's when yes. they come out and want you to purchase the ticket. They actually will – they'll they'll take a famous person, and in the last 15 minutes of their act, as they built up to it, they'll start collecting the yeah. check. Yeah. That happened to me just a few weeks ago in, in D.C., and I was just like, really? Like, just – you can't fucking, you know, turn the room over? It, it, it's – it is so – ugh, it's just – Yeah. That's why there's really nothing that compares to the seller. There's nothing. The only negative thing I would say about the comedy seller, to in complete frankness, is that, is that there's too much pressure on me to do my best joke. Me, 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 me. Well, I, me, well, I am part of this podcast, me, and we are discussing me, the comedy me, seller. Me, me, me. So, I, but right. I'm not the only one. But, A lot of people say that they're afraid to do new material at the comedy seller. That may be a good thing. Do it during that the week. That may be a bad thing. Do it during the but week. But I'm just saying if there's if that's the one negative thing that comes out of the hyper success of the comedy seller is that not just me, 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 but comics are and we do have a new a new joke night here that comics can can go on and do their new jokes there. But I'm just saying that's that is the one thing that that I do here is that comics want to put their best foot forward, which of course you as a club owner w- would want, I assume. No, I think uh, Noam yeah. is very into the process. Noam? Well, I, I understand. I, I do – I'm torn. I do I do like – I would like the comics to be able to do – to work out material. But, of course, the audience has to come first. And that's why things like New Joke Night, where um, the audience understands the parameters of the show, are great. And I'm happy to have that. Um, listen, I used to go through this with my band in the old days. I – the the weekends would be so packed I mean, the lines and sold out. We felt a tremendous pressure to do everything, you know, all the, 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 the best songs and, and never deviate from the arrangements, not take any chances. And we hated it. We always looked forward to the 
the the Wednesday night show that was you know very sparse because we could do whatever we wanted and often we play better music those nights but you couldn't count on it so we couldn't take those chances on a weekend so I get it and you can put your new jokes in the middle and, yeah I, I will start I will end. I will sandwich one in sometimes. Uh, it's just, I just feel a little bit more uneasy about it. I, other clubs, I, I do new jokes with a lot more, uh, with a lot, uh, you know, with a lot more ease. That's all I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I don't, I'm it's, not, it. it's not just the new jokes. It's the, the, the inability to, to, to relax and be at ease. Um, that's a problem for some performers. It's not a problem for, but for a lot of performers, it is, it is, there's a particular vibe. It's, you know. You're you're up, you're into it, but you're not too nervous, and it's not it, it's not uh, bases loaded, uh, bottom of the ninth, but it's still a kind of pressure, and and that's kind of you know the sweet spot for a performer, and it's it, you can't the pressure may be too much sometimes at the at the cellar. I love the cell. I love that. That makes it so exciting for me. Oh, you're you're miss you're Mrs. October. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm a neurotic yeah. person who's always feels under pressure. So, but yes, the seller that would be a little bit more so. No, and yeah. what about your Monday night music nights? Do you feel pressure? You every Monday night at the Olive Tree, which includes tonight, uh, Noam and his band play music, and and do you find yourself at all stressed out? Do you get stage fright at all? You seem so happy up there. I envy. I look at you. I say, I wish I could be happy all my life as Noam is right now playing that mandolin. Is well, music it, uh, is different Judy than is comedy. Smiling. Music is different than comedy, but. Uh, yeah, I do get do you stage think music fright. Is, you think comedy is scarier than music? Yeah. Yeah, way scarier. Well, it's way not scarier. Only, not only is it way scarier, but the act of doing comedy isn't doesn't doesn't is not primitive like music. Music, you're grooving, you're 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 listening to other people. Music is a, just a different art form altogether. And music, it's a, his music is a group effort. You know, we're up there. It's not like, and even a singer is singing so, someone else's song most of the time. Someone yeah. else's song. Um, it, it, it's yeah. It, comedy is so personal. Well, also comedy, you get evaluated after each joke. Right. You get a you get a, a Yelp review basically <laughs> after every joke in the form of laughter. Yeah. Uh, music. Which is, yes, that is right. You have that. The audience's response is the most important element of our creative process. And I guess, Noam, there is, I guess you can kind of see when you look into the audience, you kind of get a notion if they're enjoying it or not. It's not quite as clear cut. Oh, no, it's clear cut. It's um, clear cut. I, do you think so? I mean, oh, yeah, also I, when people yeah, don't I, like songs, they're not screaming out like that they hate you and you suck, right? right. Like there are hecklers when you're performing also, which I think is unique to stand up. Right, there's no fourth wall. But it's also, you know, People go see Billy Joel to hear his 30-year-old songs, 35-year-old mm -hmm. songs. Those would be the newer songs. Right. <laughs> and they he, he keeps selling out. But people don't want to hear a comedian's joke 15 times. Right. They want to hear something new. All, I have a whole thing about this in the show, you know, that Leonard Bernstein never looked to the insurance adjuster in the third row and was like, Dave, what do you think? Too much oboe? You know, like, <laughs> it doesn't happen in other art forms. Where you're relying on the audience. And then if they turn on you or they're not listening, there's no comedy without nuance, intent, and context. If they can't, you know, listen to, to, to what right, you're no full thought. As, there's no such thing as background comedy. There is Music can be a background activity. People can have conversations while right. listening to music uh, as they do. Um, but comedy requires full attention. Right. So that that's another big difference. This is an interesting uh, conversation all of itself. Like you can have background music, right? And so that's an art form you use it for background music and right. fine arts like paintings and stuff like that. This is really just decoration. Like I like right. uh, on the one hand we take it so seriously, on the other hand, but what do we use it for? We use it mostly for decoration, right? It's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> like very you, you don't spend right. very much time like looking intently at a at a painting. You, know, you look at it intently right. once or twice when you get it, and then it becomes decoration. It's even below background right. music. I mean, even when you go to an exhibit, it's like you go in, you see the painting, 
And then you move on. And you're like, oh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that painting. And then you move on with your life. Right. It's not like even if the artist is there, you're like, that sucked. Right. <laughs> right. Redo it. Apropos of the audience wanting to always hear new stuff, is it me or are comics more prolific than they used to be? This idea of coming up with my new hour, uh, you know. I don't think they're all quality. Yeah. But I think because of social media, eating up all your material so quickly um, you know, putting it on TikTok or whatever the hell, the Instagram. I resent social media so much. I mean, I went on the road. I was on the road. I had once, we had no phones. We had no computers. We had no FaceTime. We had nothing. Ugh. I brought a two-cup coffee maker from Zay Bars <laughs> and some ground coffee. And I had a one suitcase that was a junk drawer. It was literally my books, my notebooks. I brought my clarinet. Like, I would... Just you had to you had to do the work. You had to get on stage that night and be prepared. It wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna make I think I think people are putting out less quality stuff. Because in the name of satisfying the demand for new material. Right. And it I think it takes a long time to really make your act as great as it can be. I've no, I've seen so many people do specials and they're brilliant and then they get another special a year later and they've eaten up all their material they worked 10 years for and they're not prepared and it it I think it lowers the standard of comedy, you know, but who the hell knows? I mean, well, yeah, it's necessarily you're not going to come up with the same quality in a year that you came up with. Right, but you know, in But 10 years. Dan, there are club owners not at the cellar but I've talked to club owners where they they see someone it has a viral video and they want to do stand up and they'll hire them for the mm -hmm. weekend right. and sell out. Yeah. And these people have no idea what they're doing. And that's their that's that that audience's experience with stand up. Will they go back to another club after seeing someone who's not a stand up like the fact that Stormy Daniels is like, oh, I'm going to go do stand up. It's like. That kind of thing. Well, Judy, I have is... to admit, I was ready to put her on. <laughs> really? Yeah, I just think it would be interesting. Like, I'm not a snob. Yeah, I would like to see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I'm just saying the fact that she she's going to get a million people, or she'll sell out, and some comedian who's been working for 20 years is a really skilled comic trying to build their audience isn't going to get the gig. Well, that that's another critical difference between music and comedy is that people... Un no, nobody assumes they can play guitar if they've never picked right. one up. But of course, everyone thinks everyone they can, thinks they can do stand up. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, so they're, they're. And the shit people say to stand ups after their shows, like, there is no, there are no boundaries. They tell you jokes, they tell you what they think of their. And she's like, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You know, I wouldn't have done that. They did Shut your fucking mouth. You know what I didn't like? No, and I don't care. <laughs> well, I actually did a joke years ago about date rape, and I was, <laughs> after the show, uh, was um, reprimanded by an audience member, and I just made the executive decision never to do the joke again. Not because I... It, are you going to well, do I'll the tell joke? You, yeah, I, I, I'll do the joke. The joke is, you know, date rape, I thought that meant when you force a woman to go on a date with you. You know, you're like, you're like get into that movie theater. <laughs> And and sit in the front row and strain your neck because you like it rough. That was the joke. Um, <laughs> somebody so somebody said to me, you know, rape is not funny, and and I just said, you know what? I didn't think I don't feel I was making light of rape. It was just a play on words, but I I didn't want to hear it from other. If it's going to offend somebody, I was like, fuck it, I don't need the joke. I'll I'll do without it. But um, I wasn't taking any kind of you know. I I didn't feel like taking a stand. Right. Well, I think that's what Judy was saying, right? Like, you have to be careful now about what you say if you don't want to, quote unquote, ruffle people's feathers. But I or you say, like, no, I'm going to keep making that joke because... Because my intent is blank. And if you take it that way, that's the way you're taking it. Um, and that's about you. It's right. not what right. I am trying to say. Uh, and that's just, yeah. I mean, everyone, every moron's opinion is valid now because we have social media. Well, that's really the, the, the uh, 
and as I said, I think the major difference. I don't think people are any less um, uh, liable to be offended than they ever were, but they ha- now have a outlet. Right, to, to you gang can tell up on two you. friends. Oh, I saw this comedian. They sucked. I didn't like them. They did a joke about blah, and that would be the end of it. But now you can get on social media and and you know it's same with restaurants. I mean, like so the there wasn't a table for you, so you're gonna fucking write a terrible review and ruin that oh, person's Judy, livelihood. It's, wor- it's worse than that. I get people who complain about something. Often they have a legitimate complaint. They'll they'll put it on Google, and then right. they'll contact me and say, "If you give me a refund, I'll take down my complaint." No they, they, fucking yes. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, 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 well, I just had that recently, and um, first of all, they're so stupid. I would I would have taken care of them anyway. But anyway, um, I've heard of blackmail, but black email. Hey now, but, but, da, so I, da, but da, da, da. Google has a as a facility for the owner to to uh, to contest a, re, a review, and the category I chose was that there was a legal problem, and I wrote that the customer is you know extorting you know, and I think Google took it seriously because I think the customer said they were being investigated now by Google. I'm like, good for you, good for you. Wow. They don't know yeah. who they're dealing with with Noam, you know. I, what's that? What'd you say, Judy? Right I said they don't know what, who they're dealing with. Judy, by the way, did you hear the news uh, about the Comedy Cellar expansion? Yes. About the, uh, for those of you who haven't listened to previous episodes, Noam bought the McDonald's on, on 6th Avenue and West 3rd Street, and there'll be a, and the Comedy Cellar is expanding. And uh, Noam, is there any, um, I, last, last time we spoke, I guess you just said you were starting to work with the architect. Are you going to keep any of the McDonald's like um, stuff, like like anything for the walls or anything? All of it. It's, it's going to look like McDonald's. <laughs> Shut up. No. You got no, something. We're gutting, we're gutting the whole thing. There is this kind of uh, iconic uh, basketball mural that they have up there in the mezzanine that people seem to be attached to. I don't know what to do with it. I could sell it on eBay, give it to it. I don't know. I, I thought I could put it outside of my backyard. We have a little basketball hoop, but, it, but I'm told it's paper mache, not plastic. So anyway, um, yeah, we're getting uh, – I have to get the demolition permits together. I'm trying to settle on contractors and stuff. Um, I'm a little worried about How many about seats the, will it be? 200 seats. I'm, I'm a little wow, worried about – Wow, that's so exciting. I'm a little worried about the um, – the, the the rumblings that the banking system may be uh, in a little bit of a, a in, you know, have a little issue right now and how that might affect my ability to get financing that I need, but cross that bridge when I get to it. I love I it. Go, I don't want to go you to know, the mall. It it's so weird because when I went to LA in the 91, 92, and then I um, lived there when I was on a series and stuff, and I, I was working at the comedy store. And they had three rooms. And I had never seen a club with three rooms. And I would go from room to room to room. I would have like, you know, four spots, five spots. And and it was, and each room had its own audience. I mean, the belly room was the greatest because I just loved it. And Mitzi would give me Friday nights at eight. It was so fun. I learned so much and I really developed my act. But that's what I, like, I love going from room to room at the cellar. I love it. And they all yeah. have their own personalities. Yeah. And what's your favorite? Okay. I have to say, I have so many memories of the cellar. The original. Oh, my God. I, I started working there in 87. I used to sit in the back with, um, oh, my God, that borscht with the boiled potato. Um, I would sit in the back with uh, Daryl Hammond. Um. And he would get on stage, and what's his name? Bill Grunfest was there, and and um, what's his name would also play the piano. Um, tra- uh, Charles Charles Zucker Zucker, and just like Ray and Attell. like we all. It was, I don't know. It was, it wasn't packed. We took so many risks. Yeah. Um, we would egg each other on. Um, it was really such a cre it was a room full of creativity and warmth and just 
I don't know. We're like, I still, like, I still walk in, like, you walk in there and I'm like, oh my God, like, this is home. It's home. When I, I will be so fucking miserable. Um, I know that's shocking. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I suffer from depression, anxiety, but when I have a set and I get to, it's, I just walk in there and I'm just like, thank you. Thank you. I just, this is where I belong. I don't know. I, I love that. So I, I have so many memories in that room. By the I way, I also on, on love the, the underground. Yeah. On, oh, I forgot to answer an email. But on, on, on the subject of a tell, I went into the cellar the other night, late night, and the tell was doing his spot. I hadn't been down there in a while. And this guy, I mean, he's, he's got to be about my age or a little bit younger. I'm 60. This guy had the full charisma everybody in that room and every staff member and all the comedians just hanging on every word it is unbelievable what a force he is and continues to be and he was uh. so goddamn fucking genius funny oh yeah that guy is he is a national treasure it's not sufficiently known in the United States of America what right. a genius he is it was just I, amazing I was there take. The first time he ever went on stage, I was emceeing at Comedy U Grand. He was at NYU, and he came in, and I remember one of the jokes. He said, everyone has, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he said this joke. Uh, everyone has an eating disorder now. The other day, I walked by Macy's, and the mannequins had their fingers down their throat. <laughs> and... I was like, that is so fucking funny. And he got off stage. He's like, oh, that was horrible. I go, you are so funny. I was like, you are so fucking funny. And yeah, he would come back to, he would come to Comedy U Grand at 55. I, I used to Street date Street. the daughter. I used to date the daughter, the stepdaughter of the, of the guy. Owner? Uh, was he actually the daughter? Bert, Bert, the daughter. Bert the Paul. Do yeah, uh, Mackenzie. The, the owners name? were Bert and Paul. Maybe it was Bert. I forget which one, Bert. But her name was Lisa Ann McKenzie. So the the dad's must father must be McKenzie. Anyway, I don't know. Oh, um, you... She was super hot. I'll tell Juanita. Anyway. But did you know that Michael Chiklis was the bartender, and he was dating this woman, and the woman. His father was like, D he's a bartender at a comedy club. With it. And she broke up with him and he was so sad. And then he got that, that part as John Belushi in the movie and, you know, moved on to become a huge star. And every time I see him, he is just the warmest per Every comic says, you know, whenever I see Michael Chiklis, he is the nicest one, most wonderful. Yeah. But he was the bartender at. at I, uh, I don't know who that is, but I have to go. He's uh, the commish. <laughs> Whatever. I have to go. I miss I'm... you. Yeah. Is okay. okay well, we, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. I think it's about. Ariel to... didn't say a fucking thing this whole podcast. Well, you guys had a lot to talk about. Um, I don't. I, I don't need to talk just to hear myself speak. To hear your nasal the, Jewish this... nasality of. <laughs> deviated septums okay all right so let me just say before i go congratulations to to judy gold Thank her you. show is fucking phenomenal i hope it it has the run and the success that it deserves she has a, a, every reason to be extremely extremely proud and by the way judy i you know one more thing i was very very impressed at the way you remembered all your lines, because I know at our age, that's quite a challenge oh, to remember 50 I minutes, know. Of, it was... 70 minutes of lines, 80 oh. minutes. So, yeah. yeah. 78. Now, Judy, where 78 can they minutes. get tickets to your show? Um, you can go to my website, or it's 59e59.org. It The name of the theater is 59e59. It's 59 East 59th Street. But you, you can go on judygold.com. Um or 59e59. I, I find this whole and thing at the end of a show, giving out your Twitter handle, all this stuff, to be really like, do you just do you just Google Judy Gold tickets or Google Dan Adams Twitter? It's like, and so many like, people text me, how do I get tickets? I don't know. How'd you get tickets for well, Springsteen? You fucking found them online. Yeah. You know, people ask me, are you at the Comedy Tower tonight? And I say, well, you could check the website. But yeah. 
people don't seem to do that. Anyhow, uh, thank you, Judy Gold. When is this airing? This will be tomorrow night. Uh, well, no, sorry, thir- uh, when tomorrow it'll air on thir- no, it'll Thursday. No, it'll air on Thursday. I'm going everybody. Oh, I have a two, two thirty be- call. Bye, bye, bye. Azis and Pesach. Azis and Pesach. That's right. Happy Passover. Happy Every Passover day. to um, everyone. It'll air on Thursday the on second Seder. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, happy Pesach to those who celebrate. Happy Easter to those who yes. celebrate. And happy anything else. To anything Ramadan. Else that something Ramadan might celebrate Ramadan. something else. Yeah. Uh, podcast at comedycelly.com for comments, questions, and suggestions. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. So long.